My name's Bill Hughes, profession architect. I was born some 30 plus years ago in western Canada, a city called Calgary. I left home, oh, 15 years ago now. I've since acquired a wife, Nancy, a son and heir, David, a dog, and a mortgage in that order. Well, my folks have visited us, of course, but I'd really like to see the old hometown again. I'm not exactly homesick, understand, but when I expressed a desire to spend our annual vacation there, the initial reaction was only mildly enthusiastic. Calgary? Calgary? Calgary. Not New York. Not the lake. Calgary. Okay, Calgary. Ah, oh, you'll love it. Now, let's see, we could leave on a Thursday. Most people arriving by car approach from the south. Fifteen years has made a lot of differences. Quite an improvement in the road, for one thing. Oops! It doesn't take very long before you start to get the feeling of the West. An hour and a half from town, we stopped off for buffalo burgers and coffee at the Drift Willow Ranch, a folksy restaurant that far offsets some rather unusual plumbing with its Western decor. They make it very easy to find your way into Calgary with a variety of information for motorists. The tourist accommodations fronting the highway were certainly all new to me and just as good as anywhere. But this was Calgary. Our choice just had to be something much, much more rustic to please a certain party who was secretly hoping to find a bad guy behind every door. Our arrival was announced post-haste, and the last 15 years just disappeared with that first glimpse of the old homestead. My folks are always hospitable, loving, and sentimental. Only, they say it with roast beef, Alberta corn, and all the trimmings. Better roast beef than the best we can buy at home, I'd only told Nancy about a million times so far this trip. Oh, drive 500 miles before supper, eat and talk like there's no tomorrow, and 9 o'clock seemed high time to investigate our motel's claims to comfort. Since I was so many years out of touch, our first morning stop was down to the Tourist Information Center, housed in a typical prairie railway station, vintage 1900. The massive 5900 locomotive, largest in the British Empire, is a survivor of Canada's steam engine era of travel. Dubbed Hospitality Center, the name stands for free, factual, and friendly information. We'd only glanced briefly towards downtown in the excitement of arriving, and I just wasn't aware of the new-look skyline. Nan was just as surprised since I'd told her that a hundred years ago the only tourists around here were a few explorers opening up the west and modern architecture meant teepees and log forts. I don't think she'd expected much change, frankly, but she was as pleased with our discoveries as the other tourists flocking in from all over. Calgary didn't even exist until 1875, then only as a small Royal Northwest Mounted Police Post. The name, I recall, is Gaelic for clear running water, and the city is now the largest in area in Canada. It's amazing to see a place in this day and age retaining so many of the warm Old West ways and traditions, in spite of the hustle and bustle of a growing metropolis with its advantages and disadvantages. By lunchtime, we had had enough walking, so a tour of some of the residential areas was indicated. Our first stop was up in the older Mount Royal setting with its gracious homes and gardens, colorful French street names, 
and green-thumbed gardeners. I couldn't even place some of the newer districts, though. They say the city has expanded further than they dreamed possible. Well, then I had it. We used to hike out this way, camp overnight, and brag about what we'd do if a coyote came prowling around in the dark. A lot of today's modern apartment settings were just our vacant lots. We banked and boarded them for hockey rinks in the winter and gunny sack them for summer baseball. Lots of memories for me. Then I realized that Dave had his own memories to build today, and he wasn't getting much material. Small boys can only take so much sightseeing, and it seemed it was about time for action, nine-year-old style. There's never anything to compare with the old swimming hole, and mine was just about as remembered even if not as warm as the new city pools. I warn Dave that you can't expect most women folk to be too interested in stockyards and cattle. The only kind of livestock Nancy likes well enough is when it's off the hoof and on the plate, rare and juicy. It was Grandad's treat that night, and there couldn't have been a better one. His model railroaders club is one of the many active arts and crafts groups who use the new Allied Arts Center for their workshops, exhibits, meetings, lectures, schools, even intimate theater. Quite a place, and quite a day. Manlike, Bill had quite neglected to tell me about Calgary's fashions, an omission which his mother and I simply had to correct the next morning. Frontier pants and bright cowboy shirts have been adopted as acceptable sportswear. I couldn't really see anything wrong with the casuals I'd brought along, but when in Rome, you know, so? It's simply unthinkable not to own a white cowboy hat. Some are ten-gallon size, big enough for my horse to drink from. Oh, boy. To be in keeping, the stores really should have been false-fronted all of those TV westerns. Instead, they're polished glass outside and sophistication within. Imported Scandinavian glassware, British woolens, Irish linens, and very favorably priced. There's no sales tax. I'm spoiled forever. And some domestic goods are rare bargains in summertime. Would Bill recognize the economy of a trotter-length mink? Specially reduced? Sure he wouldn't. The 75 degree weather was just perfect and spirits were willing but the flesh was weakening. The old bones can only take so much, not to mention the budget. All the travel brochures call Calgary the friendly city and I must admit, tourists appear to be popular with all the local inhabitants. With Mom and Nancy apparently determined to buy the town, it was just as well that Dave and I spent an economical morning at Happy Valley, an unusual 460-acre family-type fun park just outside the city. The day before, we'd seen how much the face of the city had changed, so I was better prepared for our afternoon session. Overlooking the city, the $5 million Jubilee Auditorium can seat 2,700 people and the same progressive style of planning is evident in such educational centers as Canada's newest university. Winter and summer, Calgary has a yearly average of six hours of sunshine a day, and the prairie's wide sky look is made to order for the jet-busy McCall International Airport, only 15 minutes from downtown. After a certain amount of prodding, the Bill Hughes guided tour concluded with a low-cost, half-hour aerial panorama. Oh, a 3,400-foot altitude and low humidity is wonderful. Sure can play you out. Dad told me St. George's Island is the biggest zoo in Canada. And a natural history park, too. 
And that's why there's animals like old Denny, the dinosaur. All the animals here are real, or were real, but not all of them are alive. The real and the live animals are smaller. Gyro, the baby elephant, was my favorite. I got some great souvenirs made of petrified bones in a craft shop that was Calgary's very first old log cabin. gardens, there are all sorts of things to see. More than just gardens, anyway. Pools with all kinds of trout fish in them, and all sizes, because this is the biggest trout hatchery in Canada. In the aquarium, the Western Horseman Museum is sure different and exciting. At lunch, we decided to get out of town for a change, so I told them what I could remember about the old Turner Ranch, 38 miles southwest of town with one foot in the Old West. Then I showed them where the other foot was, right on the country's richest resource, oil and natural gas, and byproducts like sulfur. The first Turner Valley well blew in about 1914. The field is still producing, though now it's dwarfed by the dozens of more recent discoveries that have made Calgary Canada's oil capital. After a wrong turn somewhere, uh, we stumbled across the Millerville Church, an historic shrine worth a visit unintentional or otherwise. Apparently, it was doubtful if the stockade-style log construction would even stand the first winter but it's still in weekly use. Nearby High River was one of the original frontier towns on the old Hoop Up Trail stage route. When we reached there, they were still whooping it up in a highly original manner, too, conducting the only rodeo on the continent in which all competitors are girls. All girls. For Nancy, it was a flabbergasting introduction to rodeo, the West's great outdoor sport. I waited to the last minute to tell Dave that one of my old friends had a boys and girls dude ranch that we could visit on our way back to Calgary. It was soon enough, though. He was so absorbed in the business of imitating his current favorite Western hero that he forgot he didn't know how to ride. With a saddle sore offspring unloaded on our built-in sitters, it was time to wine and dine my best girl. Surprisingly, Calgary offers a greater variety of attractions than many a bigger city. The trouble isn't what to do, it's what to do first. With so many intriguing possibilities, you just can't go wrong. Since the holiday trend is to overeat and under-exercise, old Doc Hughes prescribed soft lights and romantic rhythms, taken as directed some six times hourly until relaxation sets in. The doctor also warned against all undue over-exertion. seem to come awfully early. But you forget all your troubles during the hour and a half drive west along the Trans-Canada Highway into the Canadian Rockies and world-famous Banff National Park. It's strictly illegal and dangerous to feed the outwardly friendly bears, and the practice will stop just as soon as the bears learn to read the signs. 
All national parks are sanctuaries for wildlife. I envied Nan and Dave right then. They were seeing Banff for the first time. A pleasure I'd enjoyed so many years before that I'd lost all track. I wondered what Dave would recall best about the Swiss-like resort town. Which of his impressions would be most vivid in his schoolroom travel time essays next winter? As for Nancy, there was absolutely no question. Mounties always get their men, and the women too, it seems. It's not fair. She hasn't looked at me like that in years. The castle like Banff Springs Hotel was all we had time left for. It was so much still unseen, we agreed we'd have to stop overnight. Banff is an old friend of mine, but I had never enjoyed myself more. In 1899, a flooding mountain stream washed away a railroad bridge and stranded four trainloads of passengers at Banff. To entertain them, a program of Indian dancing and rituals was hastily arranged. It was the first of the Banff Indian Days, which now draw 10,000 spectators annually and bring 1,000 Indians to an ancient campsite at the foot of Stony Squaw Mountain. On Tunnel Mountain, there's another meeting place, the internationally known Banff School of Fine Arts. Students and instructors come from all over the world to participate in six weeks of classes more often held outside than in. On nearby Sulphur Mountain, it only takes 10 minutes to reach the top of the world. An enclosed gondola lift runs right to the peak of the 7,500-foot mountain. The view is a full circle of 360 degrees. Its circumference is the horizon of mountain tops some 90 miles off. The mountain was named for the deep sulfur springs that bubble out at the base, and the naturally warm water is very popular the year round. With only one more day to spare, there was so little time and so many places unexplored, places like Jasper, Moline Lake, the Valley of the Ten Peaks, Waterton Park. It was a tough choice, but we headed west early next day past Mount Eisenhower to our first stop, Lake Louise. Fed from towering Victoria Glacier, it's one of the seven loveliest landscapes in the world, to quote the Chamber of Commerce. If Lake Louise is the picture window of the country, then its refrigerator lies a couple of hours north. The Columbia ice fields cover 130 square miles with ice to depths of two and 3,000 feet. The drip alone from this giant ice cube is enough to begin three of North America's great rivers. Bone-shaking snowmobiles are the only way to explore the five accessible miles of the largest glacial field on the continent south of the Arctic Circle. Midsummer skiing is not as easily come by as the more popular winter type, but the developed sportsman doesn't have to let a few mere miles of jagged snow and ice stand between him and the pleasures of the glacial snow dome. Driving east from Calgary next day was a dream come true for Dave with an unhoped-for glimpse of a small, honest-to-goodness cattle drive. The city of Drumheller is located one and one-half hours to the northeast in the middle of the Badlands, the graveyard of the dinosaurs. Paleontologists from around the world have come here to uncover bones, fossils, and prehistoric skeletons, and their discoveries are found in museums of a dozen countries. The 
distorted landscape as a result of centuries of erosion. The 36-mile dinosaur trail winds and bumps its way past a most amazing conglomeration of Mother Nature's formations and the odd man-made creation, including the world's biggest little church, ideal for small, very small weddings. I want to tell you, it was a blow to a young archaeologist when his important discovery turned out to be an unpopular calf skull. Calgary's annual stampede is like a big birthday present, and they can't wait to unwrap it. As a consequence, they have a score of stampede warm-up events. The biggest, I guess, is breakfast at the Hayes Farm the Sunday before stampede opens. Not everyone is there, it just seems like it. 3,000 specially invited guests were fed in less than one hour. no lack of afternoon activity either. You can take your choice from a number of events. Touring Goombe entertainers direct from Nassau and the Bahamas. Sailboating within the city limits. English-style cricket matches that stop for tea. Or international polo checkers that stop at nothing. When I was Dave's size, this poor man's grandstand above the pre-stampede midway was our idea of fun. Well, then they sawed us to the grounds, a good place to search for drop change after the shows were gone. You have to get up early on Monday morning, largely because of the other 150,000 spectators jamming the streets for the opening day parade. Along a route that not too long ago was an Indian trail. The stampede itself dates back to 1912, and the kickoff parade is intended to be symbolic of the history of the West, from earliest Indian days through the coming of the mounted police, the ranchers and settlers, right up to the present. Out of the stampede grounds, not even a mile from downtown, Dave could think of nothing handier than being an Indian boy for the rest of the week. Families from a dozen tribes live in their own village right on the grounds, conveniently close to the million and one fond delights of the midway that are so near and dear to a boy's heart, his mother's nerves, and dad's pocketbook. Weekday morning, you can eat free flapjacks and bacon, courtesy of the numerous cowboy cooks slaving over their chuck wagon lunch counters. A block or two away, the main street is turned into a gigantic dance floor, a quarter of a mile long. Traffic halts, all work stops, and everybody dances, for better or worse. As I said, everybody dances. Actually, the daily Indian tribal dances and full costume parades are so much more interesting simply because you get so close to them. We'd save the best for the last, our last afternoon. The original purpose of the infield rodeo events was to preserve the skills of Western ranch life. It was once feared that they might become lost in the era that had made the horse obsolete. The stampede both fulfills its purpose and provides solid entertainment for upwards of three quarters of a million total attendants in six days.
spectacular of all the rodeo events, though, is the nightly chuck wagon racing. This Rangeland Derby originated at the Stampede way back when, and it's hard to top for spectator interest just about the time the wagons get into the home stretch. Even with rodeo all over for the day, there's still no shortage of things left to do. If only my family weren't so blame energetic, and my feet would just stop aching. We left Calgary next day the way you try to slip away from a gay party, uh, saying thank you as gratefully as possible. A cheerful background took the sadness out of our farewells, though, and judging by the incoming tourists, only my folks would even notice our departure. Then I decided I'd better half apologize for having overruled other holiday plans. Well, next year it'll be uh, New York or the lake, eh? New York? The lake? Not Calgary? Okay, okay, Calgary. Calgary.